friends of Memphis Theological Seminary. I am Lee Ramsey. I teach pastoral care and preaching at MTS for those of you who I haven't had a chance to meet before. I'm glad you're joining us for this Sunday morning seminary as we look this week and next week at uh, the whole issue of grief and faith uh, and the topic of we do not grieve as those who have no hope. It's certainly relevant for us in some very fresh ways right now as we continue to live under the pall of COVID-19, even as we begin to see rays of hope breaking through. Uh, for many of us, the grief has been profound, and for the culture as a whole, it will last for a long, long time. Um, this is a little bit different because I'm pre-recording this uh, session and next week's session, given that I'm a local pastor myself, a United Methodist pastor. I have a small church that I serve up in Tipton County in Tennessee, and I am with them on Sunday mornings at this exact time. And so I've pre-recorded this for you, but I want to encourage you to lift up questions either in the chat box or the question box. And uh, Nathan Brassfield, who is monitoring these sessions, uh, will be able to capture those this week. And I'll try to address some of those questions next week as we move uh, to, from today's lesson on kind of the psychosocial dynamics of grieving and what we know about grieving from a social and scientific and experiential standpoint to a turn next week to the theological and biblical and Christian resources for responding to grief and loss in our own lives. Uh, so I hope you'll stay with us for the journey and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm gonna uh, put up a PowerPoint for us and uh, move us through today's session on the psychological and social and experiential dynamics of grieving as we understand it today. All right, let's begin with some definitions. Uh, this is material that I have adapted uh, from one of the best books, uh, though quite dated now, on the understanding of loss and grief in the Christian tradition. Uh, grief is, can be defined uh, briefly as the normal response, emotional, spiritual, physical, the normal response to a significant and perceived loss. It represents a whole group of powerful feelings that emerge when we lose someone. We often think of grief uh, related to the death of a beloved person or family member or friend, uh, but it also relates to the response to a loss of a particular thing. Uh, so it is a particular response to a particular loss of a particular person or thing, and grief is idiosyncratic. And by that, I mean, of course, it is unique for each one of us, depending upon who we are and the kinds of losses that we've sustained. Now, we often use the language of bereavement as well, and I think of these two as companions, but slightly different. A grief is what we feel or think or experience bodily in response to loss, but bereavement is the active process of coping with it. Uh, and bereavement is both an individual and a social process. Uh, funerals, rituals for the grieving and in respect for the dying are all a part of our social bereavement rituals. And we sort of work at these losses as we bereave, uh, go through bereavement individually, but also socially. And the largest example, of course, uh, from recent history in the United States was probably September the 11th, 2011, the falling of the Twin Towers or the attack on the Twin Towers, in which many, many individuals grieved, but we also grieved as a culture. Now, right now, as a culture, there is massive loss going on all around us in the midst of a global pandemic. 
as you well know, the moment seems particularly heavy or full as a moment of social and personal bereavement in response to loss. When we pause to think just a minute about these pandemic induced losses, um, they are multiple and they are complex. Uh, I don't think I have nearly begun to even know all the losses that I personally have experienced as a result of the pandemic, much less the losses that you or you or the society as a whole worldwide and national has experienced. These involve people that we personally love, but strangers who are also part of our global experience. And you see the numbers on your screens. How can we possibly grieve this many losses effectively? Uh, we have lost physical contact with loved ones. Some of you have not been able to see parents or grandparents or grandchildren for months and months. Our social interaction has been severely curbed. I have grieved not being able to interact physically with my colleagues at MTS Seminary, uh, at, with our students who were regularly in and out of uh, classrooms prior to last March, 2020. The social interactions that we have in our churches have affected a profound loss upon us or the loss of those social interactions. Jobs, homes, sacred gathering places. We have much that we have lost and therefore grief has followed in its way. Now, um, Loss, while it can be categorized in a number of ways, uh, at least occurs in these six ways um, that I just want to run through real quickly with you. Uh, material loss. You might lose a beloved object, a, a ring from a wedding uh, representing your vows, or the burning down of a home or a business or a church. Uh, these are physical material losses that do provoke profound emotional, physical, spiritual, and mental responses that fall into the category of grief. Of course, relationship loss, either through a death, uh, through divorce, through an unexpected or expected move to another location of a beloved friend or family member, the list goes on. And even I would put in this category loss of relationship, for example, with a beloved pet, uh, who really, in our day and time, uh, we view as uh, furry family friends, those animals that we attach great love and significance to, and who uh, treat us in much the same way. Uh, by intrapsychic losses, I mean something like loss of a dream, or self-image. Uh, maybe you had imagined yourself to achieve certain things in life or to be this kind of person, uh, to be um, in a particular profession or calling, or to have completed a particular degree, or to have uh, married or not married, or to have had children or not had children. And at some point, if those things don't happen, we experience an adjustment within our minds, within our understanding of ourselves, that cause loss. Uh, functional loss, anybody who has a few years on them as I do know what this means. Uh, we, we can either by slow attrition or by accident or illness uh, undergo impairment of our bodily functions, our eyesight, our hearing, uh, our ability to walk, our ability to think, and these all cause grief as well. Similarly, role loss, um, I once was um, an effective member of a work team and now I'm retired and I don't know quite to do what, well with myself. I was once married, I lost my spouse. Now, who am I? Um, I was once a friend to this person, they turned on me or they moved away and the friendship was uh, threatened and severed. And then finally, there is systemic loss, the kind of changes that happen across organizations over time or immediately that cause confusion within the whole 
organization or system. I think we're experiencing this in a profound way in our churches, uh, in our workplaces. Uh, think about restaurants themselves. Uh, think about businesses. And uh, even in the family, as we have all tried to adapt and reorient our lives when our systems have changed. I mean, I would rather be talking with you in person at Sunday morning seminary, not on a Zoom recorded session, but that's the adaptation that the Memphis Theological Seminary system has had to make, and it has been compounded worldwide. And uh, we, when we're honest, we calculate this as a loss, although many see gains in some of the changes that have been made. Uh, there are other factors related to losses. Some are avoidable, some are unavoidable, uh, some are anticipated, and some come upon us like a flash. Uh, while we did not anticipate the loss, losses that have happened as a result of COVID-19, um, they happened very, very suddenly. But we also now have our guards up trying to anticipate what the next losses might be that would flow from this pandemic. And you can relate that to many other things that happen in your life. Some grief is what we call short-term and intense. That is, I lost my mom uh, three years ago, for example, in March. And um, for a period of time, certainly the, the immediate weeks after my mom's death, but then for several months on into the first year, I knew that I was grieving fairly intensely. But then things began to change over time, and we're going to talk a little bit more about phases of grief and how these things change over time. Uh, but then we move into an interesting category that some are beginning to talk about as long-term after grief. That is the grief that follows after an intense period of mourning. Uh, Hope Edelman has written a very recent book. Um, I believe you can see this. I hope you can call The After Grief, Finding Your Way Along the Long Arc of Loss. This is a social psychological study, not a theological one, uh, but in which she talks about this long period of mourning that follows uh, intense periods of grief, and it can last for years and for decades and even for generations, uh, as grief is sometimes carried across from one generation to the next. I want to read you just a brief excerpt from um, a wonderful novel by Jill McCorkle called Hieroglyphics, in which two of the main characters are 80 years old, and they're reflecting back on their lives. They have just made a significant move from the Northeast back to the South, where the husband Frank was raised, and his wife Lil uh, is looking back on her life, and she's reflecting back onto the time in which her mom died when she, Lil, was a very young child, but her mom was only 34 years old. And so Lil, the child, has carried the grief of losing her mom early in life throughout her 80 years. And listen to this paragraph. Sometimes I feel like a big antenna circling and turning and picking up static and signals from others. Perhaps it's the result of seeking my mother and how for years I thought I saw her, a face in the crowd, a woman at the top of an escalator or turning a corner and then gone by the time I got there. I have listened and watched for her and now I am much older than she ever was. Isn't it odd the may, way my mother will always be 34, that all these times I have felt her presence, that is the person I see. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful writing about the process of loss and grief. 60, 70 years beyond the time that the speaker has experienced the loss. Now, this doesn't mean, of course, 
that the grief remains profound and intense, but it does change our way of thinking about phrases like closure and moving on and getting over it. When in fact, those who have looked more recently at the experience of grief tell us that the wounds and pain that we bear while lessening over time do indeed leave um, experiences of in woundedness and scars that last a lifetime after grief. An important factor when we talk about loss and grief. Now, Judith Viorst wrote, um, she was the one y'all that wrote, uh, y'all may know the children's story, Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. <laughs> But she's also written a number of things that deal with life transitions, um, life at 40, life at 50, life at 60. And this book that I've referenced here on the PowerPoint, uh, Necessary Losses, The Loves, Illusions, Dependencies, and Impossible Expectations That All of Us Have to Give Up in Order to Grow, a long title, but a meaningful one, in which uh, Judith Vior says, that um, all of losses in life, uh, many of them are necessary, even if avoidable or unavoidable, uh, because in order to grow as a person, loss is entailed and significant. So in order to grow as an adult, for example, uh, I have to let go of childhood as as we think about scripturally, um, you know, when I was a child, I thought like a child and I reasoned like a child and I acted like a child. But when I became an adult and mature in faith, I had to give up childish ways, uh, as Paul says in his letters. So when you stop to think about it and reflect on your own life, you can probably recognize the transitions and moments and those intense experiences of loss and grief that when you look back, you say, well, there was some growth and change necessitated by my adaptation to that grief and to that loss. Now, don't take this to mean that, well, whenever somebody is experiencing profound grief, you and I offer any consolation at all by saying, well, don't worry about it, kind of like Job's friends. Um, you're certainly going to learn something from this. Uh, that's little comfort to me after I have lost a beloved person or home, for example. But the truth is that in the long run, over time, loss can become and often does become the catalyst for growth and change, it is necessary. Um, Hope Edelman quotes in her book, um, a writer who says that the cost of admission to real life is the pain of grief. And while that is true, it necess doesn't necessarily make grief any easier. Now, Wayne Oates, in his little book, uh, Southern Baptist Seminary Professor, before the change and the what we have come to um, really name as the fundamentalist takeover of the Baptist Seminary. Uh, prior to that, Wayne Oates, great pastoral theologian out of the Baptist tradition, uh, wrote a little book called Grief, Transition, and Loss. Grief, Transition, and Loss, The Pastor's Practical Guide. And he gives us another typology of grief that I want to run through with you here briefly, in which he tries to name the various kinds of grief that we experience in response to loss. Uh, look and listen to these. I think you will find some connection in your own experience. The first one he labels anticipatory grief, or what we think of as double grief. Now, this usually occurs whenever 
someone knows that they are either facing a terminal or, or have contracted a terminal illness and have been given uh, an idea from the doctors and the hospice workers that the end of their life is coming. We don't know exactly when, but it's in the somewhere near future, the next three months or six months or one year or one week. And so the one who is dying anticipates their, their, their death and their grief begins to come on to them in installments as they grieve all the ones that they will be losing. And this is true for the family members as well. You may experience this as retirement approaches, as I am beginning to experience anticipating my own retirement or a move that is impending, uh, but is six months out and you were doing the work of saying goodbye. It's called double grief because when you think about it, uh, particularly with relationship to death, the person who is dying is losing all that is familiar to them and letting go of all that, all of those whom they love and all of that which they love in life. And the people who know and love them are grieving in anticipation of the death or the loss of their loved one. And so it has a double side to it. Um, and we say here, sometimes people say that this kind of grief is somewhat easier to endure because as we say, there's time to prepare yourself. And what we're really saying is there's time to begin grieving now before the loss actually and finally occurs. I can grieve moving out of a home or changing careers and leaving a familiar workplace over time in installments so that when that day comes, it's not like a steamroller. Now, the opposite of this is the second one on your screen, and that is sudden or traumatic loss and grief. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. This is the call in the night that you do not want to get. Uh, this is the announcement on the radio or the TV of a powerful uh, traumatic loss. This is the car wreck. This is the heart attack. This is the fire while you were away on vacation. Uh, this is the plane crash. And all of it happens so suddenly that we have no preparation for it. And we do feel like we have been hit by a train. Uh, this is one of the most difficult griefs to deal with because of its sudden and unanticipated nature. And the trauma or the wound that is caused is so deep and cuts so hurtfully down into our psyche and into our emotions. The danger here, of course, is that we will either shut down and try to um, act as if nothing has happened or be the hero and pretend that our shoulders are broad enough to bear the pain for everyone else um, or to uh, go into uh, a terrible spiral that leads to um, the second uh, I'm sorry, the third type of grief, and that is chronic sorrow, where our pain is so profound and so lasting that uh, we remain in a state of constant sorrow. And what's the, what's the old uh, Appalachian tune, I am a man of constant sorrow, um, sung by Doc Watson. Uh, this is different from after grief. Uh, after grief has a tenor of um, successful or meaningful coping rather than successful, meaningful coping in response. But chronic sorrow has a kind of dark timber to it and maybe, in fact, uh, lead one to a chronic depression from which there seems to be no exit or no end. 
think about it. Now, there is also near miss grief. Um, this is not so common, but does happen regularly. There are soldiers who returned from war who lost a buddy or a fellow soldier who was standing right next to them just a second ago and stepped in the wrong direction uh, and is no longer with us. There are those who walk away from car accidents unscathed when the other passenger or the driver has lost their life. There are parents who embrace in great relief their children after a mass school shooting, but feel guilty because other parents are bereft by traumatic loss of their beloved child. So this grief is complicated. It usually involves a sense of guilt and asking the question, why not me? How did I escape the flood, but my neighbors did not? How did I manage to get free from the, the falling burning tower but thousands did not. How is it that our family has avoided COVID-19 and others who I know and love have fallen tragically to this illness? Sometimes the literature talks about grief as being pathological. That is, I kind of mentioned this in the category of chronic sorrow grief, but grief that has an abnormal quality to it and an unhealthy quality, right? So we would expect anyone experiencing intense grief to have a identifiable set of, or an identifiable but various set of emotional and physical responses. For example, loss of appetite, uh, agitation, uh, loss of sleep or sleeping too much, um, drinking too heavily, or shutting down emotionally from contact with others. Uh, uh, a sense that life has become flat and there's no reason to get up out of bed in the morning. Imagining that we are hearing the voice or seeing the presence of the loved one who has come back to visit us in the middle of the night. These and many, many others are normal symptoms of intense grief. They will lessen for the most of us over time and as we adapt and adjust to life without the beloved person or object or place or set of relationships. But some will become stuck and the grief will become obviously pathological to persons who are caring for this other person or are in close proximity. Uh, so grief turns into chronic depression, not just chronic sorrow, but clinical depression. Depression that needs professional treatment, either through talk th therapy or through medication or combination of both. Uh, the person may permanently shut down Withdrawal, close the windows, close the drapes, lock the door, do not go out of the house for fear that deeper grief may wait or another loss may be on the doorstep. Uh, persons may become profoundly sick through lack of adequate diet or physical exercise or care. Uh, some extreme exacerbated responses have included over the years, um, and Wayne Oates talks about this in his book, uh, a family member who asked to have their beloved one um, sealed up, embalmed and sealed up in a plexiglass bed and coffin and set up permanently in their living room. Uh, pathological grievers may not be able to enter the bedroom of the beloved lost son or daughter. It's not only that they hold on to those things that were important representing the son or the daughter. That seems fairly normal. I'm going to keep this old coat. I'm going to keep their awards. 
I'm going to pack them away in a trunk where I can visit them from time to time, or I'm going to leave their favorite painting up on the wall. Uh, but those who are pathologically grieving may not even be able to change one little thing in the room or never enter it again, or only allow certain people to enter it, right? And so it's sad and tragic, but such a person becomes caught and stuck in their grief. And they really do, friends, need professional help. Even you as pastor or lay caregiver or friend might want to do your very best. But in this case, the very best is to try to help them find through referral someone uh, that they can help. Now, the fact of the matter is that we don't all want to be helped. Some of us wear our grief like a familiar cloak, and the pain that we know is better in our own mind and in our own emotions than the pain that we fear or anticipate. And so we hold on to what we know, even if from the outside it might look to others to be harmful to ourselves and cutting our lives short. Finally, uh, Wayne Oates talks, and I find a lot of connection with this, uh, about a tragic sense of life. If you were in caregiving work, a minister, a nurse, social worker, a doctor, um, an EMT, uh, a caregiver for seniors, uh, anyone who is relying upon you for support and care, you see a lot. Um, I'm doing myself doing a funeral tomorrow for a beloved church member, 90 years old, who I was particularly close to, and I'm not looking forward to it one bit. Um, and I've done hundreds of these over the years of 35 years of ministry, as have many of you, or you have lost lots of people or cared for lots of people that have entailed loss. And what happens is over time, we recognize the truth, uh, the gospel truth, that life is full of challenge and some tragedy and great grief and great sorrow. The women at Jesus's death don't go to the tomb because they are happy. They go to the empty tomb because they are grieving and they are offering themselves and their know-how to minister to his lifeless body through the appointment of oint through the applying of ointments and the uh, enshrouding of Jesus's body. And so grief is all through the scriptures. It's all through our lives. And you develop a sense that, you know, there is just a part of life that is tragic. And so if we don't counterbalance that, and we'll talk about this a great deal more next week, with a sense of the hopefulness and the joy and the resurrection that is also a part of life, uh, then we can be weighted down and become, um, uh, if not despairing, um, wear a kind of sad face and speak with a sad tenor throughout all of our lives because we've seen just too darn much, or even, of course, become burned out or rusted out or browned out and not able to really function at a level that is helpful to ourselves or to others. Uh, now, I haven't mentioned uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Many of you, of course, know her work from the stages of grief, um, shock, numbness, denial, bargaining, um, and then acceptance, right? Or these five or six steps. I never can remember exactly in the right order, but they've been out there since the 1960s. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, many of us believe that she did a great service to the world. Um, she became very famous and her uh, stages became very popular. Um, they've been used by everybody from pastors to therapists to medical community, anyone who deals with folks that are grieving. Uh, the interesting thing, however, about Kubler-Ross's theory, uh, when you really read her story and her research, her work was not on the survivors of those who have died or who the, those people who are grieving. Her work was on the stages of grief of the person who is dying, 
right, of the person who is experiencing anticipated death. And she said that she noted these five to six stages that occurred with a lot of the people that she was working with and studying. Of course, what happened, as so often happens with profound theories, is they become popularized and kind of shorthanded. And um, everybody kind of gravitated to this because it gave us something to hold on to. Well, now I'm experiencing denial. And now I'm experiencing numbness. And now I'm experiencing adjustment. And now I'm experiencing, a, yes, finally, I have arrived at the moment of acceptance. Um, and I don't mean to make light of it, but the theory um, really has come under a lot of deconstruction over the past 25 years in the field of death and dying grief and loss, and many of the newer theoreticians have come to question its value or even its accuracy, right? And so I want to talk about that for a minute. Now, uh, the first sort of adaptation of Kubler-Ross was to think more about grief, not in stages, like now I've accomplished stage one, I can move to two to three to four to five, and we say, you know, well, if you haven't, uh, if you aren't angry, then you must not be grieving properly, and, and to force people into some kind of a stage because we are uncomfortable with their grieving and want to help them get to a place where they're better so that we will feel better. That's kind of the way that works. Uh, but the kind of revision of that looked more at phases rather than stages. And I find this pretty helpful, that grief can be categorized by a number of phases. Yes, there is a period of shock and numbness and denial. And this can be accompanied by yearning to reconnect with the loved one. I imagine that they are with me. I heard them last night standing at the foot of my bed saying, everything is going to be all right. This is a fairly common experience. I go through periods of disorganization. I can't quite get it together. My mind won't work right. I, I, my days, I used to be a well-organized and planned person, and now I just seem to be stumbling from pillar to post, unsure of what is coming next and what I want to have come next. Uh, and then a final phase of reorganization. And the, the great thing about this stage of phase theory is the idea here is that one doesn't move through these phases from one to two to three to four, but that we cycle through these phases over and over and over again with the hopes that the cycle gets smaller and it all crosses and tangles in, but that at some point we turn a corner following a significant and perceived profound loss and we enter into a place of reorganization where we, the griever, haven't gotten over the losses or have successfully grieved. Rather, we are at a place now where our life is reorganized with new meaning, and we can begin to reinvest our lives, our hopes, our thoughts, our dreams, our feelings, our physical bodies. We can reinvest them into meaningful actions, plans, and dreams, right? Because what really happens is that the particular way that each of us experiences grief can lead us to now into something that is more like a narrative or a story that changes over time and that we use to continue to help make sense out of the experiences with a loved person or a place or an object over a lifetime in the period of after grief. So the way that I think about my grandfather who died when I was 17 years old, I continue to think about him with a great deal of love and affection, but that has changed as I've learned more about how he lived his life as I have continued to grow and change, taking up some of the things that he loved, such as bird watching, uh, but also thinking about him in a more holistic way, not simply as a person that I loved and lost, but a person in the world who had his own place in existence and time. 
And so I tell the story about my papa differently, just as I will tell it differently to my own grandson, who I hope might call me papa. But if he doesn't, <laughs> I'm not going to be hurt or grieved by that, right? So when we think about this storied way of grief, it isn't so much that we get over our significant losses as that we learn to live with them by memory and story. Dr. Robert Niemeyer, who teaches right here at the University of Memphis in the field of um, death and loss studies, uh, it's the, fam the, the, the fancy word is thanatology, um, he writes that the process of grieving is a longer one than most people realize. It unfolds over years rather than months and involves periodic grief spikes years or even decades later. Right? And he's a, a proponent of and has been one of the most um, uh, well-spoken uh, describers of this kind of narrative storied understanding of how we grieve. Uh, Therese Rando, also a social psychologist dealing with grief studies, said, if someone said to me to be a healthy mourner, you have to forget the people you've loved and lost. I would say, show me to the line with the unhealthy mourners. That is, if I have to forget the person that I loved, then I would rather be unhealthy. Uh, the great novelist Isaac Dennison, uh, she's the one who wrote Out of Africa, which may be familiar to many of you, says this wonderful line, and we'll use this for closing. All sorrows can be born if you put them in a story or tell a story about them. If you think about it, um, this is what we do when we experience a loss as we talk to one another as we express our sorrows to people who are good listeners, pastors, friends, family members, therapists, we are telling the story of our relationship with the other person and the other person's relationship with others in the world so that we can bear the sorrow and put it in a helpful frame and perspective. This is why sometimes when you sit with someone after an immediate loss or a traumatic loss, they will tell you the same thing over and over and over again. I resist the temptation to say, yes, I know you told me that 15 minutes ago. Instead, we sit, we listen, and we hear them writing the story of how they will write themselves and the other person into the change that has happened in their lives. And that, folks, will kind of wrap things up for today and lead us into what will be a more direct reflection upon um, theological, biblical responses and affirmations in response to grief and loss bringing to mind 1 Thessalonians 4.13, we do not grieve as those who have no hope. I hope you'll be able to uh, join me next week or watch uh, the recording for next week. I'll look for your questions in the chat box uh, that, will be, that will be saved for us or in the question box and try to address some of those next week as well. Uh, thank you, friends, for joining us for Sunday Morning Seminary and Memphis Theological. And again, I look forward, I hope to see you next week.